nearly 40 years ago in a universe that may or may not be the same as ours, an immortal time-stopping vampire once asked a parish priest from Florida the following question. So just like the vampire, I will ask you, my viewer, the same question. Do you believe in gravity? By the end of this video, you will believe in gravity, but a version of gravity that's very different from what you've learned in classical mechanics. Gravity is not a force between two objects that have mass, with the force being described by this equation, this Newton's law of gravitation. Gravity is actually something entirely different. In the last video, we used the equivalence principle to show that light bends under the influence of gravity with a trajectory that looks something like this in a uniform gravitational field. I also argued in that last video that this bending of light contradicts Newtonian gravity because light is massless and therefore should not experience any force that causes it to change direction and therefore bend. And because of this contradiction, we need a new way to think about gravity, which brings us to this video. Now, in my view, the best way to answer the question of what is gravity is to use facts and logic to arrive at our conclusion. So I'm going to divide this blackboard into two halves, one half with facts and the second half with logic. This is just like your statement reason tables that you might have used to write proofs of theorems in your math classes, except I'm going to use facts and logic instead. The first fact I'll start with is that light bends under the influence of gravity. We showed why this is the case using the equivalence principle in the last video, so it shouldn't really come as a surprise. The second fact is that light has no mass. Now this hasn't formally been proven, but with our astrophysical experiments, the upper bound on the mass of a photon keeps getting lower and lower. It's about 10 to the negative 50 kilograms right now, and you can probably imagine that this number will continue to approach zero as our measurements get better. Also, Einstein's special relativity argues that only a massless particle could be accelerated to light speed with a finite amount of energy, so if light's traveling at light speed, it must theoretically also be massless if we are to believe special relativity. The third fact is that Newton's formulation of gravity requires that gravity be an attractive force between two masses. This is just Newton's law of universal gravitation given by the equation I stated earlier. But if light is affected by gravity despite being massless, then that means gravity cannot be an attractive force between masses. That is, facts 1 and 2 contradict Newton's formulation of gravity in fact 3. And this is going to be our first conclusion, that gravity is not an attractive force between two masses. Let's now shift our focus a little bit. Let's go on the side and talk about geodesics, or as some people pronounce them, geodesics. By definition, a geodesic is a line or a curve on a surface that denotes the shortest path, the shortest distance between two points. For instance, on a flat surface like a plane, the geodesic between two points on the plane is a straight line. This should be easy to see intuitively, the shortest path between two points on a flat surface is a straight line. But what about a curved surface? Let's take a sphere for example. If I've got two points on the surface of a sphere, then to get the shortest path between these two points, I need to draw a circle whose center is also the center of the sphere, and whose perimeter connects these two points. This is called the great circle. It's the largest possible circle that can be drawn on the sphere surface. The arc on the great circle that connects my two points, the part highlighted in purple, this is the geodesic on a sphere. The point of this second geodesic example is to show that the geodesic on a curved surface is a curve. It's not a straight line. I cannot draw a straight line on a surface that's curved. That's not possible. To get a straight line between two points on the sphere, I'll have to burrow through that sphere, and I can't do that if I'm fundamentally restricted to only the sphere surface. So going back to my facts and logic table, these two examples illustrate the point that the geodesic on a flat surface is a straight line, while the geodesic on a curved surface is a curve. The logic behind this is common sense, as we showed, but you can also show this mathematically using calculus of variations. I actually have two videos in my calculus of variation series where I derive the equations for the geodesic on a plane, straight line, and the geodesic on a sphere, arc on the great circle. The next assertion I'll make is that light travels only in geodesics in space-time. The logic behind this is twofold. First, this assertion is basically an extension of Fermat's principle for light, which asserts that light takes the shortest time between two points. So if I have two points in the same medium on a flat surface, then light will travel in a straight line to get from one point to another. You see this every day in your real life. Light usually takes a straight line. 
Now, since the speed of light locally on this flat surface is a constant, this means minimizing the time traveled between two points is the same as minimizing the distance traveled. The second part behind this logic is that objects in general tend to travel in geodesics, unless there's a net force on them. This also applies to light, except for light, you can't exert a net force on it by f equals ma because light has no mass from fact number 2. As a result, it's impossible for me to make light curve or deviate from its geodesic via an external force because I cannot exert an external force on light. So now I have three important facts. The first is fact number one, light bends or curves under the influence of gravity. The second is fact number four, that curved surfaces have curved geodesics. And the third is fact number five, that light only travels in geodesics in space-time. I'm going to use and connect these facts to describe the true nature of gravity, because Newton's description is not enough, as we showed. Now if light bends under the influence of gravity and light only travels in geodesics, so from facts 1 and 5, that means that even under the influence of gravity, light is still only traveling in a geodesic. Specifically, we showed that in a uniform gravitational field, light bends like so. But this curved path of light is still a geodesic from fact number 5. And the only way I can get light to travel in this curved geodesic is if my ray of light is confined to a curved surface. Remember, from fact number 4, a curved geodesic corresponds to a curved surface. We can then conclude that gravity then is not a force. Gravity is actually the manifestation of the fabric of space-time being curved, or having curvature. Objects that travel within that curved space-time, and that includes light, travel in curved geodesics within that curved space-time as long as there's no other force acting on those objects. This is why a ball thrown on Earth in projectile motion will follow this parabolic curved path. It's not because Earth is exerting a force on the ball, it's because the ball is taking the shortest path on a curved four-dimensional hypersurface of space-time. We just can't see that curvature, we're inside the surface ourselves, but the ball is actually traveling in that curved hypersurface. The same logic applies to light, that's why light curves under the influence of gravity. It's not because gravity is a force that attracts light, light has no mass so you can't even exert a force on it. It's because space-time is actually curved near a massive object and light is just following a curved geodesic on that curved space-time hypersurface. Now, over the last couple of minutes, I've asserted that space-time is curved near massive objects, but what about when we're far away from massive objects? Well, when we're far away from massive objects, when we're in deep space, then space-time is just flat, it's not curved. So if I were to fire a ray of light in deep space, that ray of light won't curve, it'll just go in a straight line. The same thing happens if I throw a ball in deep space, that ball will also just follow a straight line at constant velocity, as long as there's no external force on that ball. If you've seen my videos on special relativity, which I highly recommend before starting general relativity, you'll know that flat space-time has another name. It's called Minkowski space-time. So special relativity applies to flat space-time geometries, whereas general relativity is a generalization to curved space-time geometries. Anyway, that should do it for this video. It's a bit tricky and sometimes even counterintuitive to imagine gravity as something that isn't a force, to imagine it as the manifestation of the geometry of space-time, but hopefully this video gives you a logical answer as to why, just from the equivalence principle, we can draw the conclusion that space-time is a curved four-dimensional hypersurface. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.